Hi everybody, so I'm going to be reading book two of the Iliad today. Now this is the book that contains the ship's catalog. So before I get started, I actually want to talk about the ship's catalog just a little bit. What it is, why it's terrible for us, and why it's important for ancient audiences. So the ship's catalog is this section of book two of the Iliad which goes on for several pages on which it lists the names of a whole bunch of people who are sailing to Troy, a bunch of Grecians, basically, who are sailing to Troy, um, a bunch of people who work for them, who their fathers are, the names of the ships that they're on. It's atrocious from our perspective because it's long-winded, it can be kind of boring, and for me it's going to be incredibly difficult for me to pronounce a lot of these names, and it's just going to keep on going and going. Since this is not a polished version of this story, I'm not doing this like as a professional or anything, I'm just doing it to get through it, this is going to be ugly to listen to. I will warn you before I get to it, and if you want to skip over it, I'll probably put somewhere in the, um, in the description below the times when it starts and when it ends so you can just skip ahead. If you do want to suffer through it with me, though, I do welcome your solidarity. The reason why this ship's catalog is in here is because there are all these people who are being listed off who come from, you know, the little places in Greece where you don't get a lot of stories that take place. You don't get a lot of heroes that you hear about in legends and stuff. And so when you have people going around and reciting this poem, excuse me, going around and reciting this poem, you you get a chance to hear about these heroes who sailed to Troy and um, the biggest amassing of fleets that ever happened in Greek history who come from your hometown, who come from your place. It sort of gives you this feeling of like, yeah, my people were there too. My people fought alongside Achilles and Diomedes and Agamemnon for and helped conquer Troy. And it's like, it's a big deal for these people. So that's why it's in here. That's why it's important. Also, uh, it's sort of a... because the poetry was written with a very specific meter, you know, a certain number of beats, a certain type of... certain number of certain type of beats in each line, uh, being able to squeeze all of these names and stuff into a line, into several lines at a time, was considered a mark of an incredibly good poet. And it was the kind of thing where, like, you know, you start rattling off all these names and everything, the meter and your audience is getting really excited about it and they're cheering you on and stuff and unfortunately because poetry isn't such a big thing for us specifically this kind of poetry isn't such a big thing for us and because it's not even this is prose it's not even written in poetry we do lose some of the magic we lose the identification with the people for what homer is doing so while this was awesome for people at the time it possibly is awesome for some of you crazy Greek nerds and, and classics nerd out, out there, it kind of sucks for the rest of us. So that's that's how I'm going to preface this, um, and now I'm, I'm going to get into book two. I'm going to have to split up these videos a little bit, as I discovered last time, my phone stopped 20 minutes in, which was really unfortunate for me. Uh, so I'm going to have to break this up a few times, but I'll try and keep a decent flow going. So, book two. Now the other gods and the armed warriors on the plain slept soundly, but Zeus was wakeful, for he was thinking how to do honor to Achilles and destroy much people at the ships of the Achaeans. In the end, he deemed it would be best to send a lying dream to King Agamemnon. So he called one to him and said to it, Lying dream, go to the ships of the Achaeans into the tent of Agamemnon and say to him word for word as I bid you now. Tell him to get the Achaeans instantly under arms, for he shall take Troy. There are no longer divided counsels among the gods. Hera has brought them over to her own mind, and woe betides the Trojans. The dream went when it had heard its message, and soon reached the ships of the Achaeans. It saw Agamemnon, son of Atreus, and found him in his tent, wrapped in a profound slumber. It hovered over his head in the likeness of Nestor, son of Neleus, whom Agamemnon honored above all his counselors, and said, you are sleeping, son of Atreus, one who has the welfare of his host and so much other care upon his shoulders, should dock his sleep. Hear me at once, for I come as a messenger from Zeus, 
who, though he be not near, yet takes thought for you, for you and pities you. He bids you get the Achaeans instantly under arms, for you shall take Troy. There are no longer divided counsels among the gods. Hera has brought them over to her own mind, and woe betides the Trojans at the hands of Zeus. Remember this, and when you wake, see that it does not escape you. The dream then left him, and he thought of things that were surely not to be accomplished. He thought that on that same day he was to take the city of Priam, but he little knew what was in the mind of Zeus, who had many un another hard-fought fight in store alike for Danans and Trojans. That's my cat. Then presently he woke from the divine message, with the divine message still ringing in his ears. So he sat upright and put on his soft shirt, so fair and new, and over this his heavy cloak. He bound his sandals onto his comely feet and slung his silver-studded sword about his shoulders. Then he took the imperishable staff of his father and sallied forth to the ships of the Achaeans. The goddess Dawn now wended her way to vast Olympus, that she might herald the day to Zeus and to the other immortals, and Agamemnon sent the, the criers round to call people in assembly. So they called them, and the people gathered thereon. But first he summoned a meeting of the elders at the ship of Nestor, king of Pylos, and when they were assembled, he laid a cunning counsel before them. My friends, said he, I have had a dream from heaven in the dead of night, and its face and figure resembled none but Nestor's. It hovered over my head and said, You are sleeping, son of Atreus. One who has the welfare of his host and so much other care upon his shoulders should dock his sleep. Hear me at once, for I am a messenger from Zeus, who, though he be not near, yet takes thought for you and pities you. He bids you get the Achaeans instantly under arms, for you shall take Troy. There are no longer divided counsels among the gods. Hera has brought them over to her own mind, and woe betide the Trojans at the hands of Zeus. Remember this. The dream then vanished, and I awoke. Let us now together, let us now therefore arm the sons of the Achaeans. But it will be well that I should first sound them, and to this end I will tell them to fly with their ships. But do you others go about among the host and prevent their doing so? He then sat down. And Nestor, the prince of Pylos, with all sincerity and good will, addressed them thus. My friends, said he, princes and counsellors of the Argives, if any other man of the Achaeans had told us of this dream, we should have declared it false, and would have had nothing to do with it. But he who has seen it is the foremost man among us. We must therefore set about getting the people under arms. With this, he led the way from the assembly, and the other sceptered kings rose with him in obedience to the word of Agamemnon, but the people pressed forward to hear. They swarmed like bees that sally from so, some hollow key, from some hollow cave, and flit in countless throng among the spring flowers, bunched in knots and clusters. Even so did the mighty multitude pour from ships and tents to the assembly, and range themselves upon the wide-watered shore, while among them ran, wi ran wildfire rumor, messenger of Zeus, urging them ever to the fore. So, sorry, you get a lot of these personifications or deifications of ideas, like the lying dream is capitalized because the lying dream is a personification of, a, well, it's a messenger of Zeus. Wildfire rumor is also personified. Um, so, again, it's capitalized. It's, it's an entity that's running around stirring up rumors. It's a messenger of Zeus, just like, okay, anyway. Uh, so, while among them ran wildfire rumor, messenger of Zeus, urging them ever to the fore. Thus they gathered in a pell-mell of mad confusion, and the earth groaned under, under the tramp of men as the people sought their places. Nine heralds went crying about among them to, say their, to stay their tumult, and bid them listen to the kings, till at last they were got into their several places and ceased their clamor. Then King Agamemnon rose, holding his scepter. This was the work of Hephaestus, who gave it to Zeus, the son of Cronus. Zeus gave it to Hermes, slayer of Argus, guide and champion. King Hermes gave it to Pelops, the mighty charioteer, and Pelops to Atreus, shepherd of his people. 
Atreus, when he died, left it to Thyestes, rich in flocks, and Thyestes, in his turn, left it to be born by Agamemnon, but he might be, sorry, that he might be lord of all Argos and of the Isles. Leaning, then, on his scepter, he addressed the Argives. My friends, he said, heroes, servants of Ares, the hand of heaven has been laid heavily upon me. Cruel Zeus gave me his solemn promise that I should sack the city of Priam before returning. But he played me false, and is now bidding me to go ingloriously back to Argos with the loss of much people. Such is the will of Zeus, who has laid many a proud city in the dust, as he will yet lay others, for his power is above all. It will be a sorry tale hereafter that an Achaean host, at once so great and valiant, battled in vain against men fewer in number than themselves, but as yet the end is not in sight. Think that the Achaeans and Trojans have sworn to a solemn covenant, and that they have each been numbered, the Trojans by the roll of their householders, and we by companies of ten. Think further that each of our companies desire to have a Trojan householder to pour out their wine. We are so greatly more in number that full many a company would have had to go without its cupbearer. But they have in the town many allies from other places, and it is these that hinder me from being able to sack the rich city of Ilium. Nine of Zeus's years are gone. The timbers of our ships have rotted. Their tackling is sound no longer. Our wives and little ones at home look anxiously for our coming, but the work that we came hither to do has not been done. Now, therefore, let us all do as I say. Let us sail back to our own land, for we shall not take Troy. No stitches. With these words he moved the hearts of the multitude, so many of them as knew not the coming of counsel of Agam. With these words he moved the hearts of the multitude, so many of them as knew not the cunning counsel of Agamemnon. They surged to and fro like the waves of the Icarian Sea, when the east and south winds break from heaven's clouds to lash them, or as when the west wind sweeps over a field of corn and the ears bow beneath the blast. Even so were they swayed as they flew with loud cries toward the ships, and the dust from under their feet rose heavenward. They cheered each other on to draw the ships into the sea. They cleared the channels in front of them. They began taking away the stays from underneath them, and the welkin rang with their glad cries, so eager were they to return. Then, surely, the Argives would have returned after a fashion that was not fated. But Hera said to Athene, Alas, daughter of Aegis-bearing Zeus, unweariable, shall the Argives fly home to their own land over the broad sea, and leave Priam and the Trojans the glory of still keeping Helen, for whose sake so many of the Achaeans have died at Troy, far from their homes? Go about at once among the ships, and speak fairly to them, man by man, that they draw not their ships into the sea. Athene was not slackened in doing her bidding. Down she darted from the topmost summits of Olympus, and in a moment she was at the ships of the Achaeans. There she found Odysseus, peer of Zeus in council, standing alone. He had not yet laid a hand upon his ship, for he was grieved and sorry. So she went clo up close to him and said, Odysseus, noble son of Laertes, are you going to fling yourselves into your ships and be off home to your own land in this way? Will you leave Priam and the Trojans the glory of still keeping Helen, for whose sake so many of the Achaeans have died at Troy, far from their homes? Go about at once among the host, and speak fairly to them, man by man, that they not draw their ships into the sea. Odysseus knew the voice as that of the goddess. He flung his cloak from him and set off to run. His servant, Euripides, a man of Ithaca, who waited on him, took charge of the cloak, whereon Odysseus went straight up to Agamemnon and received from him his counsel, his, wow, and received from him his ancestral imperishable staff. Don't know where I got counsel from. With this, he went about among the ships of the Achaeans. Whenever he met a chief or king, he stood by him and spoke to him fairly. Sir, said he, this flight is cowardly and unworthy. Stand to your post, but bid your people also keep their places. You do not yet know the full mind of Agamemnon. He was sounding us, and ere long will visit the Achaeans with his displeasure. We were not all of us at the council to hear what he then said. 
see to it, lest he be angry and do us a mischief, for the pride of kings is great, and the hand of Zeus is with them. But when he came across any common man who was making a noise, he struck him with his staff and rebuked him, saying, Sirrah, hold your peace, listen to a better man than yourself. You are a coward and no soldier. You are nobody either in fight or counsel. We cannot all be kings. It is not well that there should be so many masters. One man must be supreme. One king, to whom the son of scheming Cronus has given the scepter of sovereignty over you all. Thus masterfully did he go about among the host, and the people hurried back to the council from their tents and ships, with a sound as the thunder of surf when it comes crashing down upon the shore, and all the sea is in an uproar. By the way, if you listen for the metaphors slash analogies that you encounter in these, in this text, it actually makes it a lot more interesting because the imagery is quite fantastic. Just throwing that out there. Also, there are some parallels between them. So if you hear a repetition or um, just a slightly changed metaphor that's been used multiple times, that probably has some significance to it. I'll see if I can point a good one out when we get to it. It'll be a while though, so don't, you know, sit on the edge of your seat. <sighs> Speaking of seats, the rest now took their seats and kept to their own several places, but Thericetes still went on wagging his unbridled tongue, a man of many words and those unseemly, a monger of sedition, a railer against all, against who against all who were in authority, who cared not what he said, so that he might set the Achaeans in a laugh. He was the ugliest man of all those that came before Troy, bandy-legged, lame of one foot, with his two shoulders rounded and hunched over his chest. His head ran up to a point, but there was little hair on top of it. Achilles and Odysseus hated him worst of all, for it was with them that he most was wont to struggle. Now, however, with a shrill, squeaky voice, he began to heap his abuse on Agamemnon. The Achaeans were angry and disgusted, yet nonetheless he kept on bawling and brawling at the son of Atreus. Agamemnon, he cried, what ails you now, and what more do you want? Your tents are filled with bronze and with fair women, but whenever we take a town, we give you the best of them. Would you have yet more gold, which some Trojan is to give you as a ransom for his son when I or another Achaean has taken him prisoner? Or is it some young girl to hide away and lie with? It is not well that you, the ruler of Achaeans, should bring them into such misery. Weakling cowards, women rather than men, let us sail home and leave this fellow here in Troy to stew in his own meats of honor and discover whether we were of any service to him or no. Achilles is a much better man than he is, and see how he treated him, robbing him of his prize and keeping it himself. Achilles takes it meekly and shows no fight. If he did, son of Atreus, you would never again insult him. Thus railed Thericides, but Odysseus at once went up to him and rebuked him sternly. Check your glib tongue, Thericides. His name is not Thericides, it's Thersides. Sorry. Check your glib tongue, the cities, said he, and babble not a word further. Try not with princes when you have none to back you. There is no viler creature come before Troy with the sons of Atreus. Drop this chatter about kings and neither revile them nor keep harping about going home. We do not yet know how things are going to be, nor whether the Achaeans are to return with good success or evil. How dare you gibe at Agamemnon because the Danans have awarded him so many prizes. I tell you, therefore, and it shall surely be, that if I again catch you talking such nonsense, I will either forfeit my own head and be no more called father of Tele Telemachus, or I will take you, strip you stark naked, and whip you out of the assembly till you go blubbering back to the ships. On this he beat him with his staff about the back and shoulders till he dropped and fell a-weeping. The golden scepter raised a bloody wheel on his back, so he sat down, frightened and in pain, looking foolish as he wiped the tears from his eyes. The people were sorry for him, yet they laughed heartily, and one would turn to his neighbor, saying, Odysseus has done many a good thing ere now in fight and counsel, but he never did the Argives a better turn than when he stopped this fellow's mouth from prating further. He'll give the kings no more of his insolence. Thus said the people. Then Odysseus rose, scepter in hand, and Athene, in the likeness of a herald, bade the people be still. 
and those who were far off might hear him and consider his counsel. He therefore, with all sincerity and good will, addressed them thus. King Agamemnon, the Achaeans are for making you a byword among all mankind. They forget the promise they made you when they set out from Argos, that you should not return until you had sacked the town of Troy, and, like children or widowed women, they murmur and would set off homeward. True it is that they have had toil enough to be disheartened. A man chafes at having to stay away from his wife for even a single month when he is on shipboard at the mercy of wind and sea. But it is now nine long years that we have been kept here. I cannot, therefore, blame the Achaeans if they turn restive. Still, we shall be ashamed if we go home empty after so long a stay. Therefore, my friends, be patient yet a little longer, that we may learn whether the prophesyings of Calchas were false or true. All who have not since perished must remember, as though it were yesterday or the day before, how the ships of the Achaeans were detained in Aulis, when we were on our way hitherto to make war on Priam and the Trojans. We were ranged around about a fountain, offering hecatombs to the gods upon their holy altars, and there was a fine, plan fine plain tree from beneath which there welled a stream of pure water. Then we saw a prodigy, for Zeus sent a fearful serpent out of the ground with blood-red stains upon its back, and it darted from under the altar on the, onto the plain tree. Onto the plain tree. <laughs> now there was a brood of young sparrows, quite small, upon the topmost bough, peeping out from under the leaves, eight in all, and the mother that hatched them made nine. The serpents ate the, mo ate the poor cheeping things, while the old bird flew about, lamenting her little ones. But the serpent threw his coils about her and caught her by the wing as she was screaming. Then, when he had eaten both the sparrow and her young, the god who had sent him made him become a sign, for the son of scheming Cronus turned him into stone, and we stood there, wondering at that which had come to pass. Seeing, then, that such a fearful portent had broken in upon our hecatombs, Calchas forthwith declared to us the oracles of heaven. Why, Achaeans, said he, are you thus speechless? Zeus has sent us this sign, long in coming, and long ere it will be fulfilled, though its fame shall last for ever. For ever. As the serpent ate the eight fledglings and the sparrow that hatched them, which makes nine, so shall we fight nine years at Troy, but in the tenth shall take the town. This was what he said, and now it is all coming true. Stay here, therefore, all of you, till we take the city of Priam. On this the Argives raised a shout, till the ships rang again with the uproar. Nestor, knight of Gerene, then addressed them. Shame on you, he cried, to stay here talking like children when you should fight like men. Where are our covenants now, and where are the oaths that we have taken? Shall our counsels be flung into the fire with our drink offerings and the right hands of fellowship wherein we had put our trust? We waste our time in words, and for all our talking here shall be no further forward. Stand, therefore, son of Atreus, by your own steadfast purpose. Lead the Argives on to battle, and leave this handful of men to rot, who scheme, and scheme in vain, to get back to Argos, ere they have learned whether Zeus be true or a liar. For the mighty son of Cronus surely promised that we should succeed, would we Argives set sail to bring death and destruction upon the Trojans. He showed us favourable signs by flashing his lightning on our right hands. Therefore... Let none make haste to go till he has first lain with the wife of some Trojan and avenged to the toil and sorrow that he has suffered for the sake of Helen. Nevertheless, if any man is in such a haste to be home again, let him lay his hand to his ship that he may meet his doom in sight of all. But, O king, consider and give ear to my counsel, for the word that I, smith, that I say may not be neglected lightly. Divide your men, Agamemnon, into their several tribes and clans, that clans and tribes may stand by and help one another. If you do this, and if the Achaeans obey you, you will find out who, both chiefs and people, are brave, and who are cowards, for they will vie one against the other. Thus you shall also learn whether it is through the counsel of heaven or the cowardice of man, that you shall fall to take the town. And Agamemnon answered, 
Nestor, you have again outdone the sons of the Achaeans in council. Would by father Zeus, Athene, and Apollo that I had among them ten more such counselors, for the city of Priam would then soon fall beneath our hands and we should sack it. But the son of Cronus afflicts me with bootless wrangling and strife. Achilles and I are quarreling about this girl, in which matter I was the first to offend. If we can be of one mind again, the Trojans will not stave off destruction for a day. Now, therefore, get your morning meal, that our hosts may join in fight. Wet well your spears, see well to the ordering of your shields, give good feeds to your horses, and look your chariots carefully over, that we may do battle the live long day, for we shall have no rest, not for a moment, till night falls to part us. The bands that bear your shields shall be wet with a sweat upon your shoulders, your hands shall weary upon your spears, your horses shall steam in front of your chariots, and if I see any man shirking the fight, or trying to keep out of it at the ships, there shall be no help for him, but he shall be a prey to dogs and vultures. Thus he spoke, and the Achaeans roared with applause. As when the waves run high before the blast of the south wind, and break on some lofty headland, dashing against it and buffeting it without ceasing as the storms from every quarter drive them, even so did the Achaeans rise and hurry in all directions to their ships. There they lighted their fires at their tents and got dinner, offering sacrifice every man to one or other of the gods, and praying each one of them that he might live to come out of the fight. Agamemnon, king of men, sacrificed a fat five-year-old bull to the mighty son of Cronus, and invited the princes and elders of his host. First he asked Nestor, and king Idomeneus, then the two Ajaxes, and the son of Tydeus, and sixthly Odysseus, peer of gods in council. But Menelaus came of his own accord, for he knew how busy his brother then was. They stood round the bull with the barley meal in their hands, and Agamemnon prayed, saying, Zeus most glorious, supreme, that dwellest in heaven, and risest upon the storm cloud, grant that the sun may not go down, nor the night fall, till the palace of Priam is laid low, and its gates are consumed with fire. Grant that my sword may pierce the shirt of Hector above his heart, and that full many of his comrades may bite the dust as they fall dying round him. Thus he prayed, but the son of Cronus would not fulfill his prayer. He accepted the sacrifice, yet nonetheless increased their toil continually. When they had done praying and sprinkling the barley meal upon the victim, they drew back its head, killed it, then flayed it. They cut out the thigh bones, wrapped them round in two layers of fat, and set pieces of raw meat on the top of these. These they burned among the split logs of firewood, but they spitted the inward meats and held them in the flames to cook. When the thigh bones were burned and they had tasted the inward meats, they cut the rest up small, put pieces upon spits, roasted them till they were done, and drew them off. Then, when they had finished their work and the feast was ready, they ate it, and every man had his full share, so that all were satisfied. As soon as they had had enough to eat and drink, Nestor, knight of Gerene, Gerin, began to speak. King Agamemnon, said he, let us not stay talking here, nor be slack in the work this heaven has put into our hands. That heaven has put into our hands. Let the herald summon the people to gather at their several ships. We shall then go about among the host, that we may begin fighting at once. Thus did he speak, and Agamemnon heeded his words. He at once sent the criers round to call the people in assembly. So they called to them, and the people gathered thereon. The chiefs about the son of Atreus chose their men and marshaled them, while Athene went among them, holding her priceless aegis that knows neither age nor death. From it there waved a hundred tassels of pure gold, all deftly woven, and each one of them worth a hundred oxen. With this she darted furiously everywhere among the hosts of the Achaeans, urging them forward and putting courage into the heart of each, so that he might fight and do battle without ceasing. Thus war became sweeter in their eyes even than returning home in their ships, and when some great forest fire is raging upon a mountain top and its light is seen afar, even so, as they marched, the gleam of their armor flashed up into the firmament of heaven. They were like great flocks of geese, or cranes, or swans on the plains about the water of, of Caister, that wing their way hither and thither, glorying in the pride of, in the pride of flight, and, and crying as they settle till the fen is alive with their screaming. 
even thus did their tribes pour from ships and tents on to the plain of the Scamander, and the ground rang as brass under the feet of men and horses. They stood as thick upon the flower-bespangled fields as leaves that bloom in summer. As countless swarms of flies buzz around a herdsman's homestead in the time of spring when the pails are drenched with milk, even so did the Achaeans swarm onto the plain to charge the Trojans and destroy them. The chiefs disposed their men this way and th sorry this way and that before the fight began, drafting them out as easily as goat herds draft their flocks when they have got mixed while feeding, and among them went King Agamemnon, with a head and face like Zeus, Lord of Thunder, a waist like Ares, and a chest like that of Poseidon. As some great bull that lords it over the herds upon the plain, even so did Zeus make the son of Atreus stand, peerless among the multitude of, of heroes. Okay, this is the part of the ship's catalog coming up. And now, O muses, dwellers in the mansions of Olympus, tell me, for you are goddesses, and are in all, in all places, so that you see all things, while we know nothing but by report. Who were the chiefs and princes of the Danans? As for the common soldiers, they were so many that I cannot name every single one of them, though I had ten tongues, and though my voice failed not, and my heart were of bronze within me, unless you, O, o Olympian muses, daughters of Aegis-bearing Zeus, were to recount them to me. Nevertheless, I will tell the captains of the ships, and all the fleet together. Peneleus, Laetus, Arcesilaus, Prothoenor, Prothoenor, and Clonius were the captains of the Boeotians. These were they that dwelt in Heria and the rocky Aulis, and who held Scoinus, Scolus, and the highlands of Eteonus, with Thuspea, Graia, and the far city of Mycalesus, or Mycalesus, not sure. They also held Harma, Elysium, and Erythai, and they had Aelion, Hyle, and Pition, Ocalia, and the strong fortress of Median, Copai, Eutresis, and Thisbe, the haunts of doves, Coronia, and the pastures of Haliartus, uh, Plataea and Glissus, the fortress of Thebes, the less, holy Onchistus, with its famous grove of Neptune, Arne, rich in vineyards, Midia, sacred Nisa, and Anthedon upon the sea. From these there came fifty ships, and in each there were a hundred and twenty young men of the Boeotians. Ascolophus and Yal... Ialminus, sons of Ares, led the people that dwelt in Ospl Ospladon and Orchomenus, the realm of the, of the Minyas. Minyas. Ostioche, a, a noble maiden, bore them in the house of Akdor, son of Azias, for she had gone with Ares secretly into an upper chamber, and he had lain with her. With these there came thirty ships. The Phocians were led by Scidius and Epistrophus, sons of mighty Iphitus, the sons of Naubolus. These were they that held Cyparissus, Rocky Pytho, Holy Cresa, Daulus, and Pane Panopius. They were and they also that dwelt in An Anamoria with Hyampolis and about the waters of the river Cephasis and Lilia by the springs of Cephasus. With their, I'm sorry, this is so bad. With their chieftains came forty ships, and they marshaled the forces of the Phocians, which were stationed next to the Boeotians on their left. Ajax, the fleet son of Oileus, commanded the Locrians. He was not so great, nor nearly so great, as Ajax, the son of Telamon. Ajax and Ajax are both important, so try to keep them straight. There's great Ajax and little Ajax, basically. This one is little Ajax. He was a little man, see? And his breastplate was made of linen, but in use of the spear he excelled above all the Hellenes and the Achaeans. These dwelt in... in... Cunus, <laughs> Opose. Caliaris, Bessa, Scarfi, Fair Augia, Tarfi, and Thronium about the river Boagrius. With him there came forty ships of the Locrians, who dwelt beyond Euboea. Euboea. The first Abantes held Euboea with its cities, Colchis, Eritrea, Histiaia, 
rich in vines, Corinthus upon the sea, and the rock-perched town of Diem. With them were also the men of Charistus and Styra. Elephenor of the race of Ares was in command of these. He was the son of Chalcodon, the chief over all the Abantes. With him they came, fleet of foot, and wearing their hair long behind, brave warriors who would ever strive to tear open the corslets of their foes with their long ashen spears. Of these there came fifty ships. And they that held the strong city of Athens, the people of great Erechtheus, who was born of the soil itself, but Zeus's daughter, Athene, fostered him, and established him at Athens in her own rich sanctuary. There, year by year, the Athenian youths worshipped him with sacrifices of bulls and rams. These were commanded by Menestheus, son of Pityos. No man living could equal him in the marshalling of chariots and foot soldiers. Nestor alone could rival him, for he was older. With him there came fifty ships. Ajax brought twelve ships from Salamis and stationed them alongside those of the Athenians. The men of Argos, again, and those who held the walls of Tyrines with Hermione and Asini upon the gulf, Troisini, A oh gosh, Aeonai, and the vineyard lands of Epidaurus, the Achaean youths, moreover, who came from Aegina and Masis, were led by Diomed of the loud battle cry, and Selenus, son of famed Capanius. With them in command was Euralus, son king of Mechistius, son of Talaus, but Diomed was chief over them all. With these there came eighty ships. Those who held the strong city of Mycenae, rich Corinth, and Cleonae, or Ornei, Arithyria and Scion, where Adrastus reigned of old. I was just reading about him in one of my other books. Anyway, Hyperesia, um, High Gonoessa, and Pallini, Aegeum, and all the coastal round and all the coastland round about Hellas, Helici, Heliki, whatever. These sent a hundred ships under the command of King Agamemnon, son of Atreus. His force was by far both finest and most numerous, and in their midst was the king himself, all glorious in his armor of gleaming bronze, foremost among the heroes, for he was the greatest king, and had most men under him. And those that dwelt in Lacedaemon, lying low among the hills, Pharis, Sparta, with Messi, the haunt of doves, Brusei, Augei, Amiklai, Amiklai, sorry, and Hellos upon the sea, Laas, moreover, and Oitulas. Well, Laas means stone, doesn't it? I was reading about that in Ovid. Sorry, I'm really... It's hard to stay focused when you're just reading a bunch of names. These were led by Menelaus of the loud battle cry, brother to Agamemnon, and of them there were sixty ships drawing up, from apart, drawing up apart from the others. Among them was Menelaus himself, strong in zeal, urging his men to fight, for he longed to avenge the toil and sorrow that he had suffered for the sake of Helen. The men of Helos and Arene, Theorum, er, Thrium, where is the ford of the river Alpheus, strong Ipe, Kiparisseus, and Amphigenia, <laughs> Telium, Hellos, and Dorium, where the muses met Thom Thomiris, and stilled Thomiris, I guess, and stilled his minstrelsy forever. Oh, because he's a minstrel, right? He was returning from Oikalia, where Eurytus lived and reigned, and, vo and boasted that he would surpass even the Muses, daughters of Aegis-bearing Zeus, if they, could s if they should sing against him, whereupon they were angry and maimed him. They robbed him of his divine, divine power of song, and thenceforth he, could, thenceforth he could strike the lyre no more. These were commanded by Nestor, knight of Gerene, and with him there came ninety ships. And those that held Arcadia under the high mountain of Selene, near the tomb of Aegyptus, no, it's not Egypt, near the tomb of Ipitus, Ipitus, where the people fight hand to hand, the men of Phineas also, and Orchomenus, rich in flocks, of Repi, Stratiae, and bleak Enipsi, of Tegia and fair Mont Montinea, of Stymphelos and Parhasia, and, or sorry, of these king... 
Agapenor, son of Anchias, was commander, and they had sixty ships. Many Arcadians, good soldiers, came in each one of them, but Agamemnon found them the ships in which to cross the sea, for they were not a people that occupied their business upon the waters. So these people from Arcadia? Arcadia was sort of like landlocked back backwoods area, basically. They had like a lake, so they probably had, you know, boats, maybe. But there's no reason for them to have ships, which is why Agamemnon gave them ships so that they could come fight. Yes, yes, okay. The men, moreover, of Buprasium and of Elis, so much of it as is enclosed between Hermini Myrcinus upon the seashore, the rock Olini and Elysium, these four leaders, and each of them had ten ships, with many Epeans on board. Or sorry, these had four leaders, and each of them had ten ships, with many Epeans on board. Their captains were Amphimachus and Thalpius, the one, son of... Teatus, C T E A T U S, the son of Teatus, and the other of Eurytus, both of the race of Octor. The two others were Diores, son of Amarynches, and Polyxenus, son of Agosthenes, son of Augeas. And those of Dilichium were this, with the sacred Echinean islands, who dwelt beyond the Sea of Elis. That's not a sentence. Okay. These were led by Megs, peer of Ares, and the son of valiant Pileus, dear to Zeus, who quarreled with his father and was set and went to settle in Dilichium. With him there came forty ships. Odysseus led the brave Cephalenians, who held Ithaca, Neritum with its forests, Crocilia, rugged Aegilips, Samos, and Zacynthus, with the mainland also that was over near the islands, or over against the islands. These were led by Odysseus, peer of Zeus in council, and with him there came twelve ships. Thoas, son of Andrymon, commanded Aetolians, who dwelt in, who dwelt in Pleuron, Olenus, Pylene, Calchas by the sea, and rocky Caledon. For anyone who plays Guild Wars 2, that's kind of awesome, because Caledon Forest, although it is spelled differently, this is C-A-L-Y-D-O-N. Okay, I'll stop. And Rocky Caledon, for the great king Oeneus had now no sons living, and was himself dead, and was also golden, as was also golden-haired golden Meliagor, Melia? Yeah, Meliagor, who had been set over the Aetolians to be their king. And with Thoas there came forty ships. Um, by the way, since I keep interrupting myself, if you try to track these on a map, the order in which they're listed in, it kind of like goes in a spiral for a little while, and then it kind of goes so that's not actually that interesting. But the spiral is fun for as long as it lasts. It, it's kind of not actually that fun. Okay, I'm gonna... The famous spearman Idomeneus led the Cretans who held Knossus and the well-walled city of Gortis, Lictus also, Miletus, and Lycostus that lies upon the chalk, the populous towns of Phaestus and Ritium, with the other peoples that dwelt in the hundred cities of Crete. All these were led by Idomeneus and by Meriones, peer of murderous Ares. And with these there came eighty ships. Tlepolemus, son of Heracles, a man both brave and large of stature, brought nine ships of lordly warriors from Rhodes. These dwelt in Rhodes, which is divided among the three cities of Lindus, Yalysis, and Camaris, that lies upon the chalk. They were commanded by Tlepolemus, son of Heracles, by As oh, son of Heracles, by Astiochia, whom he had carried off from Ephira on, on the river Seleus after sacking many cities of valiant warriors. When Tlepolemus grew up, he killed his father's uncle, Lycimnius, who had been a famous warrior in his time, but was then grown old. On this, he built himself a fleet, gathered a great following, and fled beyond the sea, for he was menaced by the other sons and grandsons of Heracles. After a voyage, during which he suffered great hardship, he came to Rhodes, where the people divided into three communities, according to their tribes, and were dearly loved by Zeus, the lord of gods and men. Wherefore the son of Cronus showered down great riches upon them. 
and Nereus brought three ships from Syme, Syme. <laughs> Nereus, who was the handsomest man that came up under Ilium of all the Danans after the son of Peleus, that is Achilles, but he was a man of no substance and had but a small following. And th those that held Nisirus, Cropathus, and Cossus, with Cos, the city of Eurypolis, and the Calydnian Kal islands, these were commanded by Phaedipus. Sorry, these were commanded by Phaedipus and Antiphus, two sons of King Thessalus, the son of Heracles, and with them there came thirty ships. Those again who held Pelasgic Argos, Alos, Alope, and Trachis, and those of, those of Thea and Hellas, the land of fair women, who were called Myrmidons, Hellenes, and Achaeans, these had fifty ships over which Achilles was in command. But they now took no part in the war, inasmuch as there was no one to marshal them, for Achilles stayed by his ships, furious about the loss of the girl Brisaes, whom he had taken from... Lern Lernesis at his own great peril, when he had sacked Lernesis and Thebe, and had overthrown Mimes and Epistrophus, sons of King Evanor, son of Salopus. For her sake, Achilles was still grieving, but ere long he was again to join them. And those that held Philake in the flowery meadows of Pyrrhosis, sanctuary of Demeter, Eton, mother of sheep, and from upon the sea, and Ptelium that lies upon the grasslands. Of these brave, Protesilaus had been captain while he was yet alive, but he was now lying under the earth. He had left a wife behind it, he had left a wife behind him in Philaki to tear her cheeks in sorrow, and his house was only half finished, for he was slain by a Dardanian warrior while leaping foremost of the Achaeans upon the soil of Troy. Still, though his people mourned their chieftain, they were not without a leader, for Podarches of the race of Ares marshalled them. He was son of Iphiclus, rich in sheep, who was the son of Philacus, and he was own brother to Protesilaus, only younger, Protesilaus being at once the elder and the more valiant. So the people were not without a leader, though they mourned him whom they had lost. With him there came forty ships. And those that held fair eye by the boy Bowen Lake, by Bee and Lake, Boy and Bee and Lake, with Boy Bee, Glafurai, and the populous city of Yolclus, these with their eleven ships were led by Eumelus, son of Admetus, whom Alcestis bore to him, loveliest of the daughters of Pel Pelias, Peleus. And those that held Methoni and Thaumachia, with Meliboia and rugged Olazon, these were led by the skilful archer Philoctetes, Philoctetes, and they had seven ships, each with fifty oarsmen, all of them good archers, but Philoctetes was lying in great pain on the island of Lemnos, where the sons of the Achaeans left him, for he had been bitten by a poisonous water snake. There he lay, sick and sorry, but full soon did the Argives come to miss him. But his people, though they felt his loss, were not leaderless, for Medon, the bastard son of Oelius by Rain, by Rainy, sent set them in array. Those again of Tricca and the stony region of Ithome, and they that held Oikalia, the city of Oikalian Eurytus, these were commanded by the two sons of Ascalpius, skilled in the art of healing, Podalirius and Macaon, and with them there came thirty ships. The men, moreover, of Armenius, and by the fountain of Hyperia, Hyperia, yeah, Hyperia, with those that held Asterius and the white crests of Titanus, these were led by Eurypolis, the son of Euaimon, and with them there came forty ships. Those that held Argasa and Gertoni, Gertoni, Orthi, Aloni, and the white city of Olo Oloosin, of those brave Polypoetes was the leader. He was son of Pirithous, who was son of Zeus himself, for Hippodamia bore him to Pirithous on the day when he took his revenge on the shaggy mountain savages and drove them from Mount Pelion to the Ithaces. But Polypoetes was not sole in command, for with him was Leontius of the race of Ares, who was son of Coronus, the son of Cyneus. 
and with these there came forty ships. Gunius brought two and twenty ships from, from Cephas, and he was followed by the Enienes and the valiant Peraibi, who dwelt with wintry Dodona and held the land around the lovely river Titaresius, which sends its waters into Peneus. And they do not mingle with the silver eddies of the Peneus, but flow on the top of them like oil. For the Titaresius is the branch of the dread Orcus and of the river Styx. Of the Magnetes, Prothos, the son of Tethendron, was commander. Tethendron. Tethendron. <laughs> of the Magnetes, Prothos, son of Tethendron, was commander. They were they that dwelt upon the river Peneus and the mountain Pelion. Prothos, a fleet of foot, was their leader, and with him there came forty ships. Such were the chiefs and princes of the Danans. Who then, O Muses, were, was the foremost, whether man or horse, among those that followed after the sons of Atreus? Of the, of the horses, those of, of the sun were... Those of the son of fairies were by far the finest. They were driven by Eumelus and were as fleet as birds. They were of the same age and color, perfectly matched in height. Apollo of the silver bow had bred them in Peria, both of them mares, as terrible as Ares in battle. Of the men, Ajax, son of Telamon, who was the foremost so long as Achilles' anger lasted, for Achilles excelled him greatly, and he also had better horses. But Achilles was now holding aloof at his ships by reason of his quarrel with Agamemnon, and his people passed their time upon the seashore, throwing discs or aiming with spears at a mark as in, and in archery. Their horses stood each by his own chariot, champing lotus and wild celery. The chariots were housed under cover, but their owners, for lack of leadership, wandered hither and thither about the host, and went not forth to fight. Thus marched the host like a consuming fire, and the earth groaned beneath them, as when the Lord of Thunder is angry and lashes the land about to Phoeus among the Arimi, among, among the Arimi, where they say to Phoeus lies. Even so did the earth groan beneath them as they sped over the plain. And now Iris, fleet as the wind, was sent by Zeus to tell the bad news among the Trojans. They were gathered in assembly, old and young, at Priam's gate, and Iris came close up to Priam, speaking with a voice of Priam's son, Polites, who, being fleet of foot, was stationed as watchman for the Trojans on the tomb of old Iseetes to look out for any sally of Achaeans. In his likeness Iris spoke, saying, Old man! You talk idly, as in the time of peace, while war is at hand. I have been in many a battle, but never yet saw a host as is now advancing. They are crossing the plain to attack the city as thick as leaves or in the sands of the sea. Hector, I charge you, above all others, do as I say. There are many allies dispersed about the city of Priam from distant places and speaking diverse tongues. Therefore, let each chief give orders to his own people, setting them severally in array, and leading them forth to battle. There's some Shatner influences there. Thus she spoke, but Hector knew it was the goddess, and at once broke up the assembly. The men flew to arms, all the gates were opened, and the people thronged through them, horse and foot, with a tramp of as great... Sorry, with a tramp of a great multitude. Now there is a high mount before the city, high mount before the city, rising itself upon the plain, rising by itself upon the plain. Men call it Batiea, but the gods know it is the tomb of lithe marine. Here the Trojans and their allies divided their forces. Priam's son, great Hector of the gleaming helmet, commanded the Trojans, and with him were arrayed by far the greatest number and most valiant of those who longed for the fray. The Dardanians were led by brave Aeneas, whom Aphrodite bore to Anchises, and, or sorry, to Anchises when she, goddess though she was, had lain up with him upon the mountain slopes of Ida. He was not alone, for with him were the two sons of Antenor, Archilochus and Achamus, both skilled at the arts of war. They that dwelt in Zelia under the lowest spurs of Mount Ida, men of substance who drink the limpid waters of the Isopus, 
and are of Trojan blood, these were led by Pandarus, son of Lycaon, whom Apollo had taught to use the bow. They that held and the, they that held Adrestia, Adrestea, and the land of Apisis, with Pitiaea and the high mountain of Terea, Terea, these were led by Adrestus and Amphius, whose breastplate was of linen. These were the sons of Merops of Percoti, who ex who excelled in all kinds of divin divination. He told them not to take part in the war, but they gave him no heed, for fate lured them to destruction. They that dwelt about Percoti and Proctius, with Sestos, Abdos, and Arisbe, these were led by Osseus, son of Herticus, a brave commander. Osseus, the son of Herticus, whom his powerful dark whom his powerful dark bay speeds of the breed that comes from the river Sileus, had brought from Arisbe. Hippothous led the tribes of Pelasgi and spearmen, who dwelt in fertile Larissa, Hippothous, and Pelias of the race of Ares, two sons of the Pelasgi and Lethus, son of Teutimus. Achamus and the warrior Peros commanded the Thracians and those that came from, from beyond the mighty stream of the Hellespont. Euphemus, son of Troisonus, the son of Chaos, was captain of the Caconian spearsmen. Pyrichmes led the Paeonian archers from distant Amadon, but or sorry, by the broad waters of the river Axius, the fairest that flows upon the earth. The Paphlagonians were commanded by stout hearted Pilaimenes from Eneti from Enetai, where the where the mules run wild in herds. These were they that held Keturus and the country round Sesamus, with the cities by the river Parthen Parthenius, Cromna, Aegialus, and lofty Erythini. Odius and Epistrophus, Epistrophus were captains over the Halaz Halazoni. Odius and Epistrophus were captains over the Halazoni from distant Alibi, where there are mines of silver. Chromus, Enemus, the augur, led the Mycenaeans, but his skill in augury availed not to save him from destruction, for he fell by the hand of the fleet descendant of Iacus in the river, where he slew others also of the Trojans. Forcus, again, the noble Ascanius, led the Phrygians from the far country of Ascania, and both <clears throat> were eager for the fray. Mesthles and Antiphus commanded Maonians, sons of Talaimenes, born to him of the Gagaian Lake. Gagaian Lake. These led the Maonians, who dwelt under Mount Smolus. Nastes led the Carians, men of strange speech. These held Miletus in the wooded mountains of Theories, with the waters with the water of the river Myander and the lofty crests of Mount Mikale. These were commanded by Nastes and Amphimachus, the brave sons of Nomian. He, went, he came into the fight with gold about him, like a girl, fool that he was. His gold was of no avail to save him, for he fell in the river by the hand of the fleet descendant of Iacus, and Achilles bore away his gold. Sarpedon and Glaucus led the Lycians from their distant land, by the eddying waters of the Xanthus. End of book two.